back with the World Soccer Talk podcast, the only podcast on the planet that focuses on watching soccer on TV, online and apps. In episode 74, we feature an exclusive interview with Mario Melchiot about the new soccer documentary from Fox Sports called Phenoms. Now, we also discuss how Fox is spinning the news that most of their commentators will be calling games off a monitor in Los Angeles. Plus, we have news about this weekend's coverage of the UEFA Champions League final and the Championship Playoff final, as well as which game last weekend was the most watched final ever on US television, and much, much more. My name is Christopher Harris, aka The Gaffer, and I'm joined today by my co host, Kartik Krishnaya. Now, Kartik, um, let's actually dive right into the championship playoff final and uh, Fulham against Aston Villa, um, two what you could say is Premier League clubs or, or previous Premier League clubs, but Premier League uh, level clubs. Uh, what are your thoughts about this game and um, also uh, where people can watch it? Well, I, I hear from Fulham fans every day, Chris, uh, and there are Fulham fans coming out of the woodwork all over the place, which doesn't surprise me because um, at one point, if you got into soccer in this country and you were looking for an experience other than supporting Man United, Chelsea, Arsenal, uh, Liverpool, you, you gravitated towards Fulham because of the American connections and because it was in London, because it was uh, one of the closest clubs to Heathrow Airport, all of those things, Craven Cottage, Shores. So there were so many Fulham fans and Chris, they, I, I, I don't want to exaggerate here, but uh, this is just a heads up for ESPN. I've gotten about a dozen complaints from them about having to uh, – many of them have subscribed to ESPN Plus at the beginning of the championship playoff. Now uh, they're shocked that they're going to have to see the final. I, I know a lot of people have Apple TV and Roku and they're able to do ESPN Plus there, but still a lot of people are using their iPads or their phones to watch ESPN Plus that they're going to have to watch this playoff final as home fans. Uh, in what would be a kind of non-traditional manner. Maybe that's the way the, the world is going, but uh, it certainly did not meet the expectations of all of them. Uh, there were also Villa fans in this country, no doubt, but uh, more Fulham fans. And it's uh, disappointing. I mean, I, I have one, uh, um, I know one Fulham fan who's an employee of a local club here in South Florida who uh, has been checking the program guide uh, on his cable service every morning. <laughs> On the ESPN channels to see if it pops up on Saturday. Well, and I, it had popped up. Yeah, I, I, I can tell him, I, 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 which is bad news, but it's not going to be on television. I mean, this is definitely ESPN Plus. This is one of their uh, one of their main advantages for ES or benefits that ESPN Plus is saying. Okay, all right, if you want to watch all the championship games, not all, but a lot of championship games, including the playoff finals and all these games and uh, even MLS games, etc. ESPN Plus is the place to go because if they put it on television, then that kind of defeats the purpose of trying to get people to sign up for ESPN <laughs> Plus. But right. the, but the, but but the thing is, Kartik. I, I mean, before this, uh, before we we hit, hit record on this uh, podcast. We were trying to remember when was the last time a championship playoff final was not shown on television in the United States, and we're thinking it's been over a decade. Which we're, we're thinking it's probably yeah. two thousand five, maybe two thousand four. I mean, it's been a long, long time. So I understand um, people's um, concerns. But the thing with ESPN Plus is they have a free trial. There's a seven day free trial. Uh, even if you have you mean an iPhone or um, iPad. Uh, you can always uh, cast it to your television set or you can run out to your local Walmart or Target and get a, um, a Chromecast that's about, I think, about uh, 25 to $30. And then uh, you can use that for the rest of your life. But you that, can that's, cast if you that smart, that's if you have a smart TV. I mean, that, well, that's... Well you, don't need, well, you just need the HDMI uh, outlet on, on your oh, TV. Okay, so even okay. if it's an older TV, just as long as it has an HDMI uh, input, then, then you're good there. And, and then it's just like watching it on television. So... It, it's changing times. I mean, it, it is. Uh, that's where but we're let's at. Let's revisit the shift from BN to ESPN and to BAM Tech. Uh, the thought was that this was going to make the championship a whole lot more accessible. It did during the season uh, because it was ESPN three. Now, at the most critical time, and I always complained for years, and, and people who follow me on Twitter know I would complain directly to BN on Twitter uh, about the um, unevenness of when they show championship matches. But in the playoffs and then the final, there was no amb ambiguity. There was no doubt. They'd show both legs on television uh, of the semifinals, and then they'd show the playoff final from Wembley and, and usually have a nice wraparound coverage around it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that that, that is the expectation we have. So ESPN gave us more access at first, and we're thinking this is great. And I I was able to follow championship more closely this season during the season, as were other people uh, who don't subscribe to I follow for their club or whatever. Uh, but then now at the business end of the season, uh, it's all gone uh, to pieces in, in terms of their accessibility. But yeah, Chris, you're right. You, you correctly point out they're trying to get us to subscribe to a product. Why not do it when they have the most leverage? Yeah, and that's the thing. You're, you're right, Kartik. It's, it is less accessible. I mean, it, and that's the thing, though, too. I'm sure when uh, the rights came up for bidding and the Football League and IMG, presumably, uh, were talking to ESPN, talking to BN Sports, and others. Well, ESPN would have been BAMTech, but I mean they're owned by the same company, uh, by Disney. But at that time, I mean, I'm sure that the the, the pitch to the Football League from BAMTech and ESPN was, "Hey, this is ESPN. We're the worldwide leader of sports. We're everybody knows who ESPN is." Versus being sports that, that had had the Pret Championship, and uh, the Football League might be thinking, "Okay, well, let's go with ESPN or BAMTech." And also, at the end of the day, too, it depends how much money uh, BAM Tech was offering compared to uh, being sports. So in the light of things, yes, it, it, it's better to actually stay with being sports and, um, and and then have make sure that being sports would be showing the game live. There's nothing else going on uh, this Sunday or this Saturday anyway on, on being sports. So just go ahead and show it. But that that's yeah, that's where we're at. I think, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of this, especially next season with the Champions League and the Europa League. Uh, and, and probably FA Cup, probably Serie A, a lot of these games and leagues and tournaments, most of those games are going to be available through streaming only and not on television. So it, we're, we're right there. Yeah, and Turner took a lot of criticism when they announced their, their plans for UEFA competitions now almost a year ago. It's been nine months so, uh, since, since that kind of leaked, and, and, and we broke some of that at World Soccer Talk. Chris, that now looks like it might be very progressive compared to what, what, what's happening to other products. We're talking about the championship now. You just mentioned Serie A and the FA Cup. I, I am under the assumption both will be off television next season at this rate and will be behind some sort of paywall or streaming only, even if it's, if it's free. Yep. And I think that's going to continue to happen. When the La Liga rights are up uh, in, in, in two years, that might be another or in a year. Uh, that might be another... Uh, league we see that happen to it might it might get to a point where you're only seeing the Premier League on American television remember Bundesliga only has two more years on this Fox deal as well so uh, it, it's a different time for sure and uh, I, I I think that it's also um, becoming complicated for USL fans because they're used to watching games in streaming but I, I've heard complaints about having to subscribe to ESPN plus now for that I think that that's a little less significant because USL needed to be associated with the with the reputation of ESPN rather than streaming their games on YouTube. So I, I understand why USL did that, but I, I talk obviously to a lot of lower division fans across the US and I'm getting a smattering of complaints where USL is and that they're on uh, they're on ESPN plus. Yeah, where we're heading is is that uh, all of the big leagues and all the big uh, tournaments and competitions will be on television. Uh, everything else beyond that is going to be streaming. So La Liga, La Liga, I see. I mean, Univision is is the is the home that 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 that's very likely that that's, that's going to happen in a couple of years where Univision is going to acquire the Spanish um, TV rights to La Liga. Um, English English could be on on streaming, yeah, definitely. But then Premier League would be on television, the World Cup, you mean the the Euros, etc. And then everything else on streaming. The other part of this too is um, DAZN, which is the uh, streaming service overseas, uh, based in the UK, and they just recently hired uh, former ESPN president uh, John Skipper. And John's a, a big soccer fan, and DAZN will be launching in the United States uh, this year. And I can see DAZN going in, uh, which is owned by Perform, going in and trying to get, gobble up some of these streaming rights. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's interesting times. And, and I guess with the championship playoff final, it's uh, a good example of something that uh, is in, in, in change. Um, so the quicker we're able to deal with the change and figure out a way to kind of get, make this the norm, I think the easier it'll be for everyone. Um, the only outlier, I would say, is, is Turner with the, the Champions League, with about half of the Champions League games being uh, on streaming and none of the games except for the final on, um, on streaming for the Europa League. That, that's the outlier. That's the one that uh, you would think most of those games would be on television. But, um, 
But then again, in the early rounds of the tournament, in the group stage of uh, the Champions League, uh, it, isn't, it isn't the most exciting one. It doesn't really heat up until in the later rounds, and, and those games will most of those games will be on television. So, so maybe Turner Sports has it right. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, two, two quick things to tie up on this conversation, Chris. One, I looked at Turner's coverage plans, and actually in the knockout stages, uh, with the exception of one uh, two quarterfinal matches on each match day, uh, everything will be on live television. So okay. uh, it, it actually, in the knockout stages, with the exception of those two quarterfinals, we already had, we had some controversy this year about games being bumped to FS2, so, uh, which would be the same games, presumably, in the quarterfinal round. Everything will be on um, on television. The Europa League, completely different situation, but again, that's a second-tier competition. Uh, group stage of the Champions League, I think we'll all have some complaints about that, but again, it's not the knockout stage. Uh, second thing, last week at Sportel Summit, I don't want to get too deep into it because the conversations, most of them were, were off the record, but the conversation, the topic of John Skipper going to uh, perform s- streaming service, which is going to launch in the U.S., was, I would say, one of the top three or four topics discussed among the executives and the people in the business that were there. There is an assumption that they're going to get very aggressive with U.S. rights, particularly soccer, because of Skipper's uh, uh, ties to the sport. So, uh, yes, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Chris. Watch that space. Uh, at least in the industry, the assumption is that they're going to get aggressive. And with everything uh, kind of falling to streaming uh, platforms, the timing might be perfect. Yeah, the funny thing is, is the one streaming service that gets left out in all of this, or seems to kind of be the the redheaded stepchild, stepchild is uh, Fox Soccer Match Pass, which used to be Fox Soccer To Go, which is actually owned by Perform but uses the Fox name. And uh, the number of rights that 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 streaming service has is becoming less and less. And the Bundesliga is the main, the main. I mean, they have all of the Bundesliga games. Uh, some of the Copa Lib games and some of the Copa Sudamericana games, and then some rugby. But but other than that, uh, it's kind of kind of getting cast aside. While all these other streaming services seem to be kind of uh, acquiring more and more rights. So Kartik, um, a lot to get to. We've got the interview with Mario Mel- Melchiot. We've got a ton of news. So let's jump into what we've been watching this past week. But let's uh, try to keep this one short because we've got a lot of stuff uh, in this episode. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh... Let's start with the Mexican Liga and Mekis, uh, uh Clausura finals, uh, both legs. Uh, uh, watch, watch them, the Santos Toluca match uh, matches. Uh, outstanding, uh, outstanding uh, football. Uh, Jonathan Orozco uh, from uh, from Santos was incredible in the second leg. So, uh, just uh, good, enjoyable football to watch. Uh, I, I think a lot of the English language audience is turning on to Liga and Mekis now, seeing how enjoyable the football is. It's not quite as uh, physical as uh, Major League Soccer. It's not quite as fast as uh, the Premier League, but I think the technical ability uh, of the players and, and, and just the uh, the tactical analysis you're seeing in that league with the importation of players like Gignac, like Holland does, some familiar names from Europe, in addition to really good South American players who come to that league because in the Mexican League you get paid on time, unlike in a lot of the leagues in South America. Uh, people don't get offended by that, but that's that's the truth. Uh, plus, 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 plus yeah. I, think, I, think, I think with Liga Mekis too is if they can actually off the pitch in terms of the marketing uh, from the league perspective and from the club uh, perspective improve in those two areas then I think the, the United States market the English language side is, is ripe for the picking I mean there's, there's going to be a lot yeah. of people that would be interested in the, uh, the league more so if it's marketed better to, um, to bilinguals and to English, English speakers yeah, I agree. So that was very enjoyable. A uh, lot of MLS this weekend I watched. Uh, we're beginning to transition from Europe to, uh, and Mexico toward Major League Soccer and USL. TFC Orlando, late uh, Toronto winner, the Portland LAFC game, which I thought was pretty good on Fox, although the ratings uh, certainly didn't reflect that, considering it came after the FA Cup final. Uh, San Antonio Tulsa, which was a USL game I watched. Be, uh, I watched it because there were three former Fort Lauderdale Strikers players, the club I worked for, the club I supported. Uh, playing in that match, so I said I would watch it. Phoenix Sacramento, uh, another USL match that was on later and after uh, the uh, Montreal LA Galaxy game, where Zlatan got sit- sent off. Uh, but um, Remy Guard's bad start at, at uh, Montreal continues with a late Ola Kamara winner for the Galaxy. Uh, that was a Monday game, a rare Monday game in Major League Soccer because of the bank holiday in Canada. And then um, the Jacksonville Miami United game last night was a really special game. 
Uh, for me personally, I have a number of friends who play for Miami United. It's a local semi-pro team. They've now knocked off two professional teams in a row, Miami FC and the Jacksonville Armada in the U.S. Open Cup. Uh, they won their first round match, too. So now they're going to get a fourth round date with Orlando at Orlando City Stadium. And the last two seasons, Orlando has been eliminated from this competition by teams from South Florida. For Lardo Strikers two years ago, uh, the Citrus Bowl, and then last year, Miami FC at uh, their stadium. So that's a very special congratulations to Robbie Sacco, who's a great owner of Miami United. He's really thrown everything into that team the last six years. Uh, real quickly, European matches, obviously the FA Cup final, it was uh, pretty blah, and I didn't like Fox's coverage at all. I didn't like the fact that... Uh, they cut out the minute that the, the, the full-time whistle came and start, went to the studio. That, that was uh, – actually, actually, I can't take I, I timed it. It was uh, – they allowed – the full-time whistle went. Martin Tyler says, Chelsea wins, and they cut him off. And then they had about, <laughs> about five to ten seconds of silence. But you could tell that they were on mic. And then, then it went over to Kate Abdo to say something, and then, and and then they came back to Martin Tyler right at, you mean what, a minute before uh, Chelsea was re- ready to lift the trophy. Trophy. And as soon as the trophy was lifted, that's it, cut him off, and then right back to the studio. T- they've done this before so many times, and to me, it's disrespectful. Um, you've got one of the best commentators in the world, whether you li- like him or not, but he's he's a legend in the game, and you just, you mean basically kind of overlap him with with your analysis which is inferior yeah so i um and, and, I, what, and what a horrible match that was i'm sorry yeah, was that was one of the worst was FA Cup oh. I, I switched to the german cup final which was eintracht and bayern which was not a horrible match and, and that was on espn news uh this is interesting espn was willing to put that on espn news but they're not willing to put the championship final on uh, i know there are a lot of bayern fans but uh honestly uh, and no offense to the bavarians out there there were more hardcore Fulham fans in this country than Bayern fans, people who were following, actually following the club week in and week out, uh, in my opinion. And, and just, just based on – that's not a, it's not an uneducated opinion. It's based on – maybe I interact with more fans of English football. I don't know. But, um, but anyway, Mark Donaldson and Casey Keller, good call of that game. Casey Keller is very good as a co-commentator. Yep. Doesn't get many opportunities on the national level. I know he, he does Sounders games, but uh, he was good. He was well-prepared. Uh, and uh, had some great analysis. Kovac, of course, beats Bayern. Now he's headed to Bayern. That's a familiar story in the German league. Uh, but uh, that was an I- interesting match. And then uh, the Juventus match, uh, Buffon's final match earlier in the day, I had watched uh, some of it. Uh, final match with uh, Juventus, I should say. Now these, these, these uh, Buffon to PSG rumors are really heating up. And um, I don't know. I'm a little torn about that. I, I would kind of like Gigi to walk away. I don't want to remember him as a PSG player at the end of his career. He's a Juve player. He's, he's an Italian great. He's arguably the greatest goalkeeper to have ever played this game. Uh, but anyway, that's a subject for another time. Uh, final thing I watched was Lazio and Inter. And how heartbreaking was this match for Lazio? Uh, they're up 2-1. Uh, they get a, a fortunate reversal, although it was the right reversal, on based on VAR in about the 70th minute when... Um, uh, Inter had been awarded a penalty. Everything is on Inter making the Champions League. I mean, they're going to be in uh, FFP trouble potentially. They're going to have to sell off their players. Uh, they held on to their players last summer, guys like uh, like Perisic, etc., because of um, their push to make the Champions League. They poached Spalletti away from Roma, um, and uh, he's a top manager. Inter get two late goals. They're in the Champions League. But, boy, it would have been nice to have seen Lazio and Roma both in the Champions League uh, and with Napoli making it a shift towards uh, the south of Italy. Uh, so Inter is in the Champions League. They're beginning to recover their neighbors uh, at the San Siro, AC Milan, all kinds of problems this week. They may not be able to compete in Europa League next year because of FFP and some ownership irreg- irregularity. So one part of uh, Milan beginning to turn it around one of the great stories in world football the last five years, Chris, has been the decline of the Milan clubs. Inter, by sneaking into fourth, maybe begin to reverse that decline, at least for them. Mm. Uh, EC Milan, a lot, lot uh, further to go. Yeah, yeah, that'll be definitely a great story to watch on that one. Uh, oh, and uh, one, one last point. Sure. Sorry, Chris. Uh, Teo Bonetti, uh, shout out to him. You've been fantastic uh, with Serie A these last few weeks, uh, as uh, it has been the most entertaining and exciting league at the end of the season from my perspective and the perspective of some others uh, of the big European league. So uh, BN has a real gem in Mateo. Uh, unfo- uh, unfortunately, we know they're probably going to lose the Serie A rights. So wherever the rights go, I hope he follows because he, he does a fabulous job with that league. 
So I'm hearing, Kartik, that uh, from one of my sources, is that B in sports may stay, uh, may um, retain the Serie A rights, but only a, a part of them. So that's the latest scuttlebutt, is that oh. uh, B in sports might, might have some Serie A games, not all of them. Um, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, that, that hasn't been worked out yet, but that's, that's a possibility. So that might not, not have been Matteo Bonetti's um, last uh, Serie A call I, for I, I, sports. I hope not. Right. I hope not. So I, I watched uh, some of what you saw. Uh, other than that, I watched the uh, Scottish FA Cup final on Goal TV between Celtic and Motherwell, uh, live from Hamden. And uh, great goal by McGregor. And uh, I really enjoyed this match. I always enjoy Scottish Cup finals. Uh, it was definitely one-sided with Celtic uh, winning this one. I think it was 2-0. But uh, Motherwell had their chances too in the second half. But I enjoyed that. And it was a rare moment to actually watch Goal TV. They had uh, Dan McCarthy commentating, um, I guess, on the world feed. Uh, I watched uh, Galatasaray's uh, game that they won 1-0 to win the uh, Turkish Super League uh, 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 championship there in Turkey. Um, not the, not one of the most exciting games by any means, but it was enough to, to win the championship there. The last but not least, I listened to, actually, I watched a podcast this week uh, that I want to give a shout out to that I thought was incredible. It's called Santo, Sam and Ed's Total Football. It's from ABC Australia. And uh, I guess it's like a weekly podcast that they do. It's available, I'm sure, through iTunes on the audio side, but also on, on the television side. Uh, they stream it on ABC Australia. And they had an episode about World Cup kits, and they went through and kind of talked about some of the ones they liked and they didn't like. But what was most interesting is they had an interview with a guy named uh, Luke Westcott, who at the age of 19 started up his, his own kit manufacturing company and design company. And he was contacting different uh, national teams around the world and was able to actually, when South Sudan became its own country, he was able to do a deal with them to uh, go ahead and design their kit, manufacture the kit just in a few short days because they had, they had a game uh, and then ship it to South Sudan for them to, to wear it. Uh, the company's called AMS and actually after that deal, uh, he's been able to do some deals, I think, with I think with Nigeria, uh, some some of the the, the African countries. Uh, but uh, a 19 year old doing these deals, designing the kits themselves himself, which the kits look fantastic, and then uh, doing deals directly and talking about what what it's like to uh, be in opposition to Nike and Adidas and Puma, wow. Puma, and how he's able to actually go to these African countries, meet with them in person, uh, and design kits that are much better than any, any Nike or I mean, Puma, Puma especially, and the Nike and the Pumas are, to me, design-wise, are horrible. Uh, Adidas is a little bit better, but not the greatest either. But um, just a really good interview. Uh, definitely check it out. It's, it's called Santo, Sam, and Ed's Total Football. Uh, highly recommend it. Okay, Kartik, let's move on to TV streaming news. Yeah, the final numbers are in for this season's coverage of the Premier League by NBC Sports, uh, English Premier League games across NBC, NBCSN, and, and other NBC Universal cable networks, and NBC Sports Digital th- drew an audience uh, delivery of about 449,000 viewers per match, up from 447, 447,000 last year. The number is down from 514,000 TV only viewers for the 15 16 season, which, of course, remember, was the season Leicester City won the title, and there was some um, increased interest in uh, English football because of that in the, in the States uh, and uh, below the 479,000 viewers on average from the 2014, 2015 season. Yeah. So it's good news. Uh, I think Manchester United's improved, um, I wouldn't say performance, but at least improved uh, ranking in the Premier League definitely helps a lot with that. Um, but the other thing I think with this context is that, um, is that NBC Sports Gold, the Premier League pass, kind of skews the numbers a little bit. So in previous years, we would have had on a typical Saturday, 10 o'clock in the morning, Eastern time, we would have had a game on NBCSN and then sometimes CNBC or sometimes USA. And now those CNBC USA games are less likely to happen, which means that uh, those numbers for those games, because they don't exist any longer, are not included uh, in the average because they're on NBC Sports Gold. And um, so if it's one more, if it's one high profile game in that 10 o'clock slot on NBCSN across the board, the numbers should be a little bit better than they normally are. So so that's the only caveat I would add. But uh, still, all in all, I mean, almost 450,000 viewers average uh, per game. That's that's decent numbers, especially with uh, declining uh, cable and satellite subscription numbers, too. 
Now, the news is in about the commentators for this Saturday's UEFA Champions League final. Uh, we understand that uh, Fox Sports will have John Strong and Stu Holden. The Spanish-language broadcaster of the game will be ESPN Deportes and will feature Fernando Palomo uh, doing the play-by-play with Mario Kempes uh, joining him as the co-commentator. Uh, they'll be joined by guest analyst Hugo Sanchez, uh, we know him, Kartik, uh, who won the 1986 European Cup final with Real Madrid. For viewers in the United States, uh, the best way to get ESPN Deportes is with a free trial to Sling Orange, combined with the best of Spanish TV package, which will give you ESPN Deportes, ESPN, ESPN2, uh, the Univision channels, uh, Universo, uh, which will show some of the World Cup games, Be In Sports, Be In Sports in Espanol, and in total, uh, 53 channels in all. And you can watch the Champions League final for free on the Spanish language side by going to worldsoccertalk.com slash sling tv offer again that's worldsoccertalk.com slash sling tv offer meanwhile for Spanish language commentary for um, on ESPN Deportes Radio it'll be uh, Jorge Ramos and Hernan uh, Pereira uh, calling the game live from Kiev Okay, uh, this is one that I think all our listeners probably already know about and have commented about, but here goes. Uh, in an interview this week with Richard Deitch from The Athletic, Fox Sports executive producer David Neal had this to say, uh, Fox's World Cup coverage. Quote, over half of the matches in America on a global basis in any given year are called off uh, the tube, which are monitors from the stadium. Um, uh, not, uh, sorry, monitors not at the stadium. There are rights holders from Europe who are not sending any talent to Russia. To me, it is a non-story. In soccer, it is standard procedure to do matches off tube. Uh, most of you who are listening have probably already had your say on this, and uh, I-, I was just floored. Yeah, so it's definitely uh, definitely Fox Sports spinning this in terms of having 66 of their uh, percentage of their commentators are going to be in Los Angeles calling the games off a TV monitor uh, in a studio there rather than being in Russia. In comparison, uh, every single uh, Telemundo commentator is, is going to be in Russia. Uh, 65% of the, the people at Telemundo, um, the commentators will be at the stadiums. And uh, I think there's a short, well, basically, what, 35% of the games will be called from a studio in Russia, in Moscow. So there's a few things in here, Kartik, that uh, I have to take issue with. Um, One where he says there are rights holders from Europe who are not sending any talent to Russia. Well, the fact of the matter is that the world feed, uh, which is mostly English commentators, uh, all of them are going to be at the stadium uh, calling the game. So if you're in Canada, you'll probably get to hear that the world feed, um, in, those of us in the United States will not, uh, unfortunately. So that's one. Um, BBC, sending all of their commentators to Russia. ITV, sending all of their commentators to Russia. So when he says there are rights holders from Europe who are not sending any talent to Russia, my question is, which countries? You mean, is it uh, Slovenia? Is it, uh, you mean, Finland? Is it, uh, you mean... You know, what, what countries are there that they're not sending the talent, um, especially English-speaking uh, talent, uh, to Russia? The, the second thing is where he says that over half of the matches in America on a global basis in any given year are called off the tube uh, from monitors not at the stadium. That, that's, that's true. I'm sure that's true, Kartik. But if you look at, say, the Premier League, every single ge- Premier League game, uh, the commentators are in the stadium. NBC Sports has gone to the, to, the, to the point of actually having their own commentators, Arlo White uh, and others, Derek Gray at times, at the stadium. So 100% of those games are. In previous World Cups, so 2014, 2010, all of the, the commentators uh, from ESPN have been in those host countries. None of them have been back in Bristol, Connecticut calling games. So when he says over half of the matches in America on a global basis in any given year are called off the tube, to me, I'm, I'm thinking that's more B in sports. So B in sports, all the La Liga games are called from, you mean, a monitor, off the tube, uh, in Miami. Uh, same thing with uh, the Liga 1 games, same thing with Serie A games. Um, that's really more of a, a cost factor. I mean, B in sports is acquire these rights and just trying to minimize expenses. And, and that's at the end of the day, I mean, if Fox came out and said, you know what I mean? The reason we're doing this is because we had to kind of cut, cut our budgets because the U.S. is not in the World Cup, uh, and, this, and that's the reason why we're doing it. Most of us would probably understand that and, and think, okay, that's, 
it's horrible. It's it's a sad situation when you've spent over a million dollars on your studio set and you've put so much emphasis on your studio set and all your talent and you've got four different uh, hosts as well as all your pe- uh, talking heads. I wish you would put some of that money uh, and budget towards the commentators. But anyway, that, that, that's my take on it. You can read the full story at willsoccertalk.com that goes into more detail. But any additional thoughts, Kantik? Yeah, so uh, a couple things here. One, uh, I would be much better if Fo- with this if Fox, as you just said, had just said, hey, the U.S. didn't qualify, we're cutting costs, instead of giving this patronizing tone. Not only on this, trying to justify cost cutting without saying, hey, we're cutting costs because the U.S. didn't qualify and there will be a lot less interest in this in this tournament uh, in the United States because the U- U.S. didn't qualify. That's very natural. Two, after you know, not applying a critical thought or a critical word to talking about the U.S. men's national team and creating this image of this great, uh, you know, potentially all-conquering side the last few years, even though to anyone who is objective, they saw – a, a, a side in decline, a side in 2015 and 2016 that was nowhere near the level they were at uh, in 2002 and 2003 or 2009 and 2010. Um, they now have very patronizingly said, well, who cares about that? You might have 116th Spanish ancestry or 116th French ancestry, so support those uh, those national teams. Who cares that the United States is not in it? They are being so patronizing. And so, again, this goes back, to, I think, Chris, to the attitude Fox has had all along in their coverage of everything, that American soccer fans are not well educated. They don't understand the sport. They don't know the culture around the sport. They don't know the history around the sport. And basically what we tell them, they'll believe. So the U.S. is an all-conquering world power. The U.S. and Mexico are the biggest rivals in the world. Then the U.S. doesn't qualify. It becomes, oh, well, we should be supporting Mexico because they're in our region. And, uh, and oh, you're 116th Spanish to so support Spain. No context, no history, no perspective. This is, and they haven't even we haven't even kicked the ball in the World Cup yet. So, mm-hmm. um, look, I'm I'm uh, I'm fed up with Fox. Uh, I have been for years, but it's gotten worse in the last few weeks, and I I really don't have anything positive to say about them. They are still patronizing to people who are core soccer fans. Maybe they don't want those people. They just want the NFL fan who's going to tune in once every four years. I guess that's it. Yeah, I will say something positive, and that is that. Uh there are good people within Fox Sports that know the game, that that are really hardcore soccer fans. That that uh, that that you know, I mean, essentially, essentially, what you have is a producer or an executive that's saying these things. And I'm sure there's a lot of people kind of underneath them, some other commentators or analysts that don't agree with that and say, okay, well, that's that's crazy. But obviously, the executives are the, are the bosses; they're the ones that are p- uh, paying the paycheck. So we got to go along with that because. Uh, that's the feeling I get is there's some really sharp people within Fox, but they just don't have any opportunity to really say, hey, let's own this. Let's make this uh, – let's improve, improve the analysis here. Let's, let's work harder on this or that. Uh, the other thing is, Kartik, is if you go back to the last Gold Cup, that Gold Cup final, to me, the, the way that uh, Fox portrayed that tournament and portrayed the United States winning the Gold Cup is, was as if they'd won the World Cup. They were going crazy over this Gold Cup in a Gold Cup competition where there were a lot of teams fielding uh, B teams or, or definitely weakened sides. And um, and that's the thing, though, too. I mean, in terms of managing expectations, instead of saying, OK, congratulations to the United States on a really hard fought uh, victory in this Gold Cup tournament. Uh, having said that, you know I mean, it's not against some of these the, the best uh best sides or kind of uh, full strength sides but uh, it is what it is but but from here this is giving a lot of confidence to move on to go into World Cup qualifying and hopefully you mean try harder whatever it may be but um, that's the thing is just when they do well it's again a typical Fox is just this rah-rah USA just hype machine and uh, when they don't do well it's it's radio silence and uh, pretending that um, the World Cup is going to be a disaster before a ball's even been kicked. That's my biggest issue, is that Fox is going into the World Cup really kind of underplaying the World Cup to me. There, it is the world's biggest tournament, world's biggest sports tournament. This is a huge thing where it's not going to be just Ronaldo, Messi and Neymar. There's going to be so many incredible stories, so many incredible moments coming out of this tournament. And Fox is already, already kind of thrown in the, in the towel. Ah, <laughs> All right, I mean, do we know? Do we know there'll be those incredible moments? I guess it's their obligation as a rights holder to build it up. But I mean, well, honestly, honestly, they just got—they're covering the UEFA Champions League. I think the level of football in that competition 
is much higher than the World Cup. I don't even think it's even comparable. I don't think it's even debatable. So um, in fairness to them, you know, given that they've covered, just they've done two legs of Bayern, Real Madrid, we're not going to see football that good well, we'll, in the World Cup. We'll see moments. We'll, we'll have uh, like a, a Van Persie goal or we'll have the... Um, yeah, that's true. What was it? Uh, the, the Tim Cahill goal for or Australia. We'll have Cinderella. We'll have Senegal make the quarterfinals, something yeah, like that. Yeah, there's, there's, always, there's always... I mean, yes, the standard of football in the World Cup is not as good as it used to be by any means, just because, I mean, it's more teams, it's diluted. Um, but but there will be moments of brilliance. There will be moments that we won't expect. They'll be like, "Holy cow, that was incredible!" So so that, that's my thing. Is is that uh, I don't know. Just Fox is just really going into this half-hearted and just really making excuses and, and not telling the truth. So let's move on, Kartik. In our next news item, uh, Kartik, uh, which major executive and listeners too can join into this? Which major executive do you think uh, said this last week? Quote. How do we build a fan base? To be one of the top leagues in the world, we've got to grow our fan base. We have to have more fans. We have to have higher television ratings. We have to engage with our fans. Maybe sports betting becomes one of those ways that we can build a fan base. We could work with some of the providers to be able to provide exposure to our players and have them engage more with our games. (laughs) It has to only be one, and it's Don Garver, unless it's one of his underlings. And and Chris, uh, just as a, uh, a, 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 pro- a promo for our, our, uh, our readers, I'm working on a story about MLS and their, uh, their strategy and, and how uh, I, I believe they might be hitting a, a point of diminishing returns in uh, terms of, of, of uh, their ability to attract new fans and improve TV ratings unless they make some serious reforms, promotion and relegation among them uh, to, the, to their uh, – to their setup, um, this uh, this quote is is mind boggling, and I have to tell you, this is typical of the way MLS and American sports executives think. Is well, maybe we can hitch hitch our wagon to gambling, and that will create more casual fans who have no actual vested interest in the sport. That works for American sports. American sporting culture is very different than football culture, Chris. And football culture is about passion. It's about um, being kind of a very ruckus supporter, it is in this country. And now I, I'm not trying to limit our ability to gain fans, but it is about a, a certain degree of uh, counterculture and, and being a hipster. And uh, this this flies in the face of that. And again, MLS does not understand the audience. They complain about all the people watching European football. They don't understand who those people are and how to get them. Yeah, it's worrying signs. I mean, when he, when he says we have to have higher television ratings and then equates that with maybe sports betting becomes one of those ways that we can build uh, the fan base. And to me, that, that that's obviously doesn't show what the issue is. The issue to me is still to this day that approximately about 50 percent of the teams in Major League Soccer will make the playoffs. Uh, even if you've come in first place, yeah, you get a supporter's shield, but nobody really cares about that that much. So for the games from March through till July, those are basically nobody really cares about those. And even when the playoffs happen, which is what well, through August through October, November ish, um, then you're up, up against NFL and college football. So then the timing is all off and. Nobody's really focusing on those games, and, and, and a lot of soccer fans don't even like the playoffs uh, idea in the first place. So, so to me, to kind of think like, well, actually, maybe sports betting, maybe that's the way to actually uh, be, uh, make Major League Soccer one of the top leagues in the world. No, it isn't. But from a business perspective, I understand what, what he's talking about. Is he's thinking about dollar signs, and that's that's his. That's all he's looking at is the dollar signs. Thinking, okay, well, sports betting. Okay, how can we get in on that and and and, and make millions that way? Um, maybe that will lead to higher TV ratings, which which hopefully he knows that that's not going to be that way. Maybe it'll help a little bit, but it's not going to make that much of, of a difference. Uh, okay, all right, let's uh, move on. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I, we, we can write a whole thousand words on that uh, alone, so we'll move on. Okay, so in last, last but not least in the news section, in last week's podcast, we scratched our heads to think of any Fox Sports analysts that we were excited about to listen to this summer's World Cup. And, I, and that was uh, on the fly, so I didn't give you any opportunity to kind of think of those. And both you and I had to kind of scratch our heads real fast and go, we couldn't really think of any. I think Ali Wagner, but then she's going to do most of the commentating. 
Um, and, and, and Stuart Holden, he's going to do mostly commentating, so there's not a lot of uh, really good analysts in the studio. Hernan, Hernan Crespo is one, though. That was one we said, okay, yeah, 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 okay, actually, that's a player with uh, a lot of experience that I would be interested in, in hearing what he has to say. Um, but, I, but I haven't heard any of his analysis, so I don't know how, what he is at, as an analyst. Until this past Sunday, uh, where he did a live phone interview with Lalas and Stone uh, during uh, an MLS game, or actually a pre-game. And with telephone interviews, sometimes it's difficult because the audio isn't as good. Um, but let me go ahead and play a clip of that, and uh, let's, let's see what you think. Just a second. Summer, um, when a player has to play with someone like Messi, one of the greatest players ever to play the game, is it difficult, do you think, for the Argentinian players to play with Messi? Do they have to change the way they think, the way that they play when they're going out there on the field? You know, for me, what 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 easy play to do with Messi? It was easy. He made me a lot. He made me a lot of uh, passes to score goals. Uh, then was 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 amazing experience. But in the same time, I, I think it's 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 it, it's not about that. I, our problem is in, in 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 terms of identity, because we have we have a new manager uh, from since the, the the ten games. Then we don't have identity. Uh, this is the problem. We don't know if we play two in the forward or maybe we start with four defenders or three defenders. Then if I, I'm very worried for that. Not 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 if somebody play with Messi or not. So there you go, Kartik. So, uh, again, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt because it is a telephone interview and it's live and uh, the audio quality didn't sound like, like there was that, that the greatest. But um, and, and Hernan Crespo as a footballer, I have a lot of respect for. I mean, really fantastic footballer with a great history. But uh, to me, though, I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, obviously, English is not his first language, so it's going to be difficult. But if that's the first piece of analysis that I've heard from him, I'm a little bit worried about that in terms of the, the Fox Sports World Cup coverage. Um, you mean how, how that's going to get come across on television? Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I think that um, he has some potential. And obviously it was a phone interview, so maybe it didn't sound very good. But there's also the um, issue of the talent that surrounds him and whether they're able to bring – the best out of them. I mean, I think there were weak links in the ESPN uh, teams that covered the Euros and World Cups recently, but you always had a studio host in, in Mike Tirico or Bob Lee or going back to the Women's World Cup in 2012 and Rebecca Lowe that was, were, it were able to, um, to really push the right buttons to get the best out of each analyst and, and cover up their weak spots. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure I trust Rob Stone with that. I do trust Kate Abdo with that, but I don't trust Rob Stone with that. Yeah, good point. All right, let's move on to TV ratings. And Kartik, a big number uh, this past weekend. And, and actually, it's a record. 1.21 million tuned in to watch Chelsea against Manchester United in the FA Cup final on Fox and Fox supporters combined. Um, that was on Saturday from 12.15 to 2.15 Eastern. It's the most watched FA Cup final ever on US television. Uh, and it's the last one from Fox. Um, the English language number is up 27% compared to last year's viewing number, which was for the Arsenal-Chelsea FA Cup final. Uh, it goes to show a few things to me. One is, I mean, just the power again of Manchester United and their fan base. And two, probably just the timing of this uh, in terms of uh, being on Big Fox and uh, being a big game that it had a lot on the line for both teams. I mean, Chelsea... I mean, wanting to win, win a trophy as well as Man United. And, uh, I mean, unfortunately, again, it was a horrible match, just a really boring match itself. But uh, big numbers for Fox. And actually, I'm, I'm sure they're going to be a little bit uh, sad that um, they got this big number and, I mean, they're losing the rights to it. And then uh, some of the other games, too. Not a lot to talk about, uh, but we had uh, Portland against LAFC on Fox, on Big Fox. That came after the FA Cup final. Uh, that one had 465,000 viewers. So in itself, that's a good number. Definitely a good number for Major League Soccer. But then you kind of look at it and go, OK, well, it's a double header. You had um, on Fox, the English channel was uh, just over a million. And then you had the Portland LAFC game right after that. Uh, under half a million. So, you mean, half of the people that watched the FA Cup final switched off the television and didn't watch the, the second game. 
Um, but uh, it is what it is. Other numbers, uh, we had the Europa League final on FS1 between Atleti and Marseille, uh, which was a, a decent, well, actually, it was a pretty good game. It was definitely, I uh, was disappointed that Marseille didn't take care, uh, their chances early in that game to make it more of a, a close fought match. But uh, 130,000 people watched that one live on FS1. And then you had Atlanta. United against uh, Red Bulls and uh, New York Red Bulls, and that one had 176,000 on FS1. And for whatever reason, FS1 MLS is still having issues on that Sunday night primetime uh, viewing with uh, just 176,000 people for that one for Atlanta United, which is, I mean, to me, the most exciting team in Major League Soccer. And uh, Red Bull, which has the best uh, young core of players and, in my opinion, the best coach in the league. Or actually, him and Patrick Pierre, the two best coaches in the league, are in, uh, uh, are, are in uh, New York. And then Tata, obviously, is in, is in that category, too. So to have a New York-Atlanta game, just think about that just from the size of the markets, too, with 176,000 uh, viewers on a Sunday night in prime time. Boy, um, I know it's going up against 60 minutes, and then it's the primetime lineups for the for the big networks. But boy, oh boy, that's that's just an awful number. Yeah, and for anyone who missed it, uh, Paul Gardner had a good piece this week about uh, Jesse Marsh, and uh, I mean, really, just I, I don't know if you read it, Kartik, but just really, uh, really, uh, I don't know, grilling Jesse Marsh on his his tactics and playing style uh, as a coach, and just uh, it was not a good read. Um, but, but, but- uh, I had not read it, but I, I would say this: um, in defense of Jesse Marsh, who is who is the, the, the person I, if you listen to me on other programs, the, the name I throw out there for the the men's national team job, if it's going to be an American coach, I think he, to me he's the clear number one. There is a a player development aspect of everything that Marsh does, and Red Bull as a as a unit does, right at Leipzig and at Salzburg also, that uh, I really appreciate. And then there is a playing style that involves a lot of short. Uh, it's maybe Wenger-esque, right? And we're not moving away from that in Europe. And, and the talk is, okay, Unai Emery, he likes possession, but he's not going to have the side-to-side stuff that, that Wenger did, uh, mastered for 20 years. But that's the way Red Bull plays. And at least they try and keep the ball, which most teams in MLS don't. So I'll be, I'll be curious to read that piece by Paul Gardner. But to me, Marsh is one of the few Americans that has a clear um, – now, they're, they're, they're managers who are good at – Tactical game plans, um, match by match, American managers. Marsh is the one American manager who has a clear style, a clear uh, philosophy, and an identity on how he wants his team to play, and he's implemented it. That's why Red Bull is impressed with him and are thinking about him for the Salzburg or Leipzig jobs going forward. Uh, so I, I'd be curious yeah. to read that. I, I often don't agree with Paul Gardner, so um, <laughs> maybe I'm predisposed not to agree with him here. But um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, I, I have to defend Jesse Marsh. Yeah, definitely Marsh. check it. Definitely Marsh. check it out because uh, Paul's got a, a different take on, on it completely, and uh, it's 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 interesting. Whether you agree with it or not, it's definitely an interesting take. Um, so, listen to Mailbag. If you do have any feedback on anything we've said in this podcast or any opinions, uh, you need advice about streaming or uh, watching your favorite uh, soccer games or soccer leagues, there's a lot of changes happening this summer. So, we definitely want to keep you up, updated on that through the website, willsoccertalk.com. But if you have any correct questions uh, directly, uh, send them to us and we, we'd love to read those out on air and then answer those questions. And that's going to benefit other listeners too. You can always reach us via email through web at worldsoccertalk.com as well as facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk and on twitter at worldsoccertalk and in the coming weeks too actually coming days uh, we're increasing the amount of World Cup coverage we've got a whole bunch of uh, World Cup previews coming, World Cup viewing guides, uh, we've got uh, the trailers from the BBC and ITV and from Fox and from Telemundo that we're posting on the website uh, in addition to all the schedules uh, information about um, 4K, HDR streaming uh, as well as interviews and speaking of interviews uh, beginning this Friday, May 25th, Fox Sports will be broadcasting a brand new soccer documentary series called Phenoms. It's going to debut on Friday night uh, from 8 o'clock Eastern Time on the over-the-air Fox network. So that's Big Fox, Simpsons Fox. The series features up-close and personal footage of professional footballers living their lives in the hopes and dreams of playing in the World Cup. Before the World Cup squads were announced, I had a, uh, a chance a few weeks ago to speak with the executive producers Mario Melchiot and David Wortham Brooks about the film, and here's that interview. I hope you enjoy it. 
All right, so I'm on the line with Mario Melchiot and David Worthen Brooks, the executive producers of Phenoms, the series that is set to premiere on the Fox Network uh, on May 25th. Now, gentlemen, um, how did this idea come up, and uh, how did you both get involved? I I had a kick around the game on Sundays uh, in Pasadena in California, and uh, somebody suggested, you know, I work at, uh, I, I was working at Fox. And somebody suggested uh, uh, talking to Mario and seeing if he wanted to be part of the kick around. And much to our surprise, he did. And um, so uh, one of those Sunday afternoons, we were talking about a, um, uh, a documentary called uh, Hoop Dreams uh, from the, uh, the early 90s, which was, uh, you know, about uh, a couple of kids from the uh, south side of uh, Chicago uh, looking to make it in um, uh, college uh, uh, basketball, um, and uh, you know, uh, which starts their journey with a uh, um, scholarships up to the north side of uh, Chicago. You know, to, to the um, you know out the, the mean streets and in, into uh, you know, uh, private schools where they're playing as teenagers. We, we, we sort of went, wow, could that be done for um, for, for soccer? And uh, it really rolled from there, you know. So, so how, about, how about you, Mario? Uh, what was your first uh, impressions of the idea for this series uh, when, when you talked to David about this, uh, about Phenoms? About, uh, I guess at that point there was no name for it yet, but what was your, your first thoughts about uh, something like this? Yeah, I mean, I was excited. I mean, it helps, of course, if you know each other a little bit, uh, know each other well, in the sense of like starting to work on a project that I think that will bring uh, uh, a better understanding of, uh, of soccer to a lot of people because uh, even David, when we were talking, there were so many questions that were coming up. And then when this uh, opportunity came along, uh, we talked about it and I was like, okay, why don't we show the world and give them the answers that a lot of people uh, are not familiar with, knowing that David is already a soccer fan and then still has so many questions. Imagine how many other people will be out there. So we could make, create something, uh, a great story where you go a little bit spur, deeper where uh, normally they don't allow you to go because I've been an athlete myself and we don't allow cameras to come in with our families and having dinner with our families or having your mom and your sisters and everything around you being filmed. And they allowed us all, they opened the doors to us to get in and for us to show the world what it takes to get to the World Cup, what is the excitement and why, uh, what do they have to sacrifice to achieve that? And then their biggest goal and the dream, and that's also the task of the journey of this uh, documentary, is making it to the World Cup. Now that, that was something. So, so I had a, had a chance to watch uh, a screener copy of of the goalkeepers uh, episode three episode, and one of the things that struck me was how in this piece is that uh, there's no uh, a narrator. It's it's the athletes. It's the goalkeepers. It's the it's the, it's the footballers that are the ones doing the talking throughout this uh, this whole uh, this whole episode. How much of that was a conscious decision to have have the athletes be the one uh, talking talking to to the the actual uh, cameras? Well, well, wherever it was possible, we, uh, we we tried to approach this in a um, in a sort of cinematic uh, style, so that um, so that the audience would be um, present with uh, uh, with the players. In uh, you know go, going through the dramas that they're going through in their lives, you know, uh, but, uh, for instance, in the goalkeepers, um, there are um, you know there's stories uh, of all sorts, uh, different dimensions, um, you know, from uh, the goalkeeper for PSG who obviously is uh, uh, well established on the map to a goalkeeper uh, a goalkeeper from um, Nacional down in uh, Uruguay um, who um, is uh, you know sort of operating at a different level, um, and, and we just wanted um, wherever possible in the storytelling to be um, to be present in the dramas of their lives rather than um, you know have somebody uh, uh, explain uh, what they're going through. But you know uh, uh, the, the the style varies through uh, through the five part miniseries and through the fifteen national specials. Um, sometimes there are narrators um, and uh, experts playing in. And sometimes the story just tells itself, um, which, you know, that, that, was, that was actually a style that um, uh, was present in uh, Hoop Dreams as well, you know, uh, of uh, the, um, uh, what they call, uh, you know, follow dots. 
Cinema Verite. Now, how were the um, the actual players uh, selected? So, I mean, looking at the goalkeepers episode as just as one example, I mean, there's no guarantee that uh, these players will be named to the squads because the squads haven't been announced yet. It's, it's in all likelihood, I mean, like a Jack Butland should get on the England squad, but you never know what might happen. How, how are these names selected? Not not just the goalkeepers, but the, for all the players that are featured in Phenoms and... Uh, how much of that was kind of predicting that these 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 players would be on on the actual World Cup squads? So um, that was one of the tasks that I took on uh, with a, a different producer that we have, it's Ivy Patricia. He came up with uh, we came up with a selected group of, of, of names, and um, I went through uh, seeing exactly what the, the players have and what their future uh, perspective would be regarding, in my eyes and my take on the game. And because I already work for the broadcast, I'm on the air, so I'm already, already um, uh, viewing the players, you understand, from a different angle. So I said, okay, get the players out. Let's see what, it, uh, what they have and where they are right now in their career and if they have the opportunity to make it to the World Cup. Now, we went along, and of course there are going to be some players that might not uh, made it, but we also want to tell the story why they didn't make it or, or what was so tough along the way to get there. Because in a journey of succeeding, you understand, it, it, there aren't, aren't only rises. There has to be some dips, because I had that in my own career, too. You know, there are uh, moments that people maybe lost somebody dearly, or they get injured, or, or the coach might not like them, or there's a preference to a different player. All those things are reality to, to soccer. So if we don't tell that, then the reality uh, of, of our, document, uh, our series and, and what we are creating doesn't make sense. So that's why we brought the truth and the, uh, the anticity of, of the realness of soccer. That's what was key for us to bring out. And that's why we selected, selected those players, really focused on the skill, the ability, and the future prospects. And I think we came pretty close on doing that. Now, Mario, how much of you did you see in the making of these stories about these footballers, these young stars uh, who are dreaming of playing in a, in a World Cup, but you mean, and dreaming of kind of the big stage? How much of you did you, did you did you see yourself in some of these these athletes? I see a lot of myself. You know, um, uh, we 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 have we have a lot of great young stars that that kicked off really early doors uh, in their careers. Like I give, I give an example, we have Adele Ali, for example. He's a top player, you understand, in England. Then we have, you talked about Butland already, the goalkeeper, you understand, fighting for his spot to make it to the World Cup. But then we go to a different, we have Marco Asensio. Then we have Dybala, for example. He's now in the situation with Messi, you understand, trying to get himself into the Argentinian team. Marquinhos won the Olympics with Brazil. Now he is, uh, is going to be part of that, that group. These are the players that we have on our document. And there are more, you understand. I mean, uh, Leon Goretzka, he's a Schalke now. He's going to go to Bayern Munich. Uh, he uh, came here to America and, and, and did super well. But these are the players that I'm saying. That is the story that you see, you know. And everybody's journey is, of course, different. But there are some, some losses in life. I mean, I, I lost my brother at, at the brink of my uh, siding of my career. I was going to retire. And then my mom said, you can't do it. You have to keep on playing because it is not only about you. It's something that he would have loved to uh, love you to do, and I wanted him. He was kind of like my idol, so I wanted to make sure that he stayed happy, regardless if he wasn't around me anymore, physically, more spiritually he was. And I think a lot of these players have moments like that, where they go really deep, and that people understand that the sacrifice you have to do to achieve success, you understand, is out there for everyone, but it's only for the ones that really want it, and that's what we're showing. Now, how challenging was it to work with uh, all these different uh, production units around uh, around the globe? Really, I mean, you got you got Russia, you've got uh, Europe, you've got I mean, you, you name it. How, how much of a challenge was that, kind of working with these different teams? Uh, well, I mean, we were lucky to be working with uh, you know really top top notch filmmakers from uh, from every continent uh, around the world. You know, where we um, uh, in the Americas, we're working with the Zimbalist brothers. Who have done, you know, numerous uh, 30 for 30s, um, it, you know, uh, award-winning filmmakers here, and then in England, uh, we're working with Paul uh, Wells 72, uh, is a great production company. I mean, basically, um, all over the world, the filmmakers made it easy for us. Uh, uh, there, there's a um, 
there is a bit of a tsunami of footage uh, coming into the central um, uh, editing hub in Los Angeles, which has been handling the uh, the, the, the five-part miniseries, is, uh, which you've seen one episode of, um, is a um, uh, takes a global perspective, um, and you know, sort of uh, uh, keeping track of sixty-five different stories. Mm-hmm. is, you know, a, a bit of a challenge. But then we, we've got a great editorial team there based in Los Angeles. So, uh, you know, that, that also uh, uh, worked out fine. So, so one other thing I, no, I noticed about the goalkeepers, uh, and again, this is the only episode I've seen of, of the series thus far, is that the pace of it is kind of a, a kind of a slow, deliberate, almost a slow burn in, in a positive way. It, it's 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 a uh, it's not your, I you mean, uh, kind of uh, a lot of flashy stuff. It's it's kind of really kind of getting to the heart of the players and getting to the heart of their their, their kind of their stories and, and as they tell it. Is that the same type of pace that we can expect in, in the other episodes? Yeah, pr- pretty much. I mean, we we, we looked at this uh, uh, um, through a, a lens of um, uh, f- uh, feature length uh, documentary storytelling. But last question, uh, guys, is that anything else that you want to share about this film, about this series that you think would be uh, of interest to, to listeners who are uh, uh, mad, passionate uh, soccer fans? Well, I think that, um, uh, you know, when you see the stories uh, b- uh, behind the, the players, uh, you will actually never really watch a, uh, a game in the same way again. I mean, it, it's uh, it just the, the, the personalities that come out, um, the motivations, you know, uh, uh, the gestures that they make, you know, players who who have these, um, you know, their, their goal celebrations that you never quite understand, uh, or you know, they're never spelled out to you. And then you look at it and you hear their story and you realize that every time Marco Sanchez scoring a goal. He's making a prayer to his mother, who um, you know, who he lost when he was uh, uh, twelve, um, and it's just uh, the the, the, um, the heart and personality that comes into um, the viewing is pretty amazing. How about you, Mario? Anything? Uh, any thoughts in terms of anything else we haven't covered thus far that you think would be of interest to to soccer fans about uh, phenoms? Yeah, I think it's definitely great. The way uh, soccer is building in the U.S., you understand? I think that's also what uh, the key things are. And, of course, we are building a documentary to support the World Cup at Fox because that's going to be the big boom. But away from that, we're going to tell you a story. Like David just said, like, you'll never watch the game the same way because you have a better understanding. You know what it takes. We go around the world. You see the sacrifices that you go from one continent and go and live in a, a different continent and have to pick up your pace or become a star because there are so many young kids you understand, around the world, especially in the USA, that wants to be professionals. And even the professionals who are already pros and coming on TV and doing all the, the pro work in America and playing for MLS, they want to go to uh, a different continent and perform there. Even they, as professionals, will understand what it takes and give them a little bit more info. And also then it goes away from the other guys. I mean, when you talk to a Del Alli or a Marquinhos or uh, Incentio, they are going to watch their, their own documentary, but they're also going to watch the stories of the other performer, uh, professionals. So if they are watching it, then you understand what kind of level we are, are tapping into. You understand? This is the real deal. This is stuff where my heart went into and David's heart went into it. And it's just that we see the rawness and the realness of what a real food, professional footballer dreams about and how he gets there. Yeah, and, and I think you, you guys have done a great job just from watching that one episode of, of really kind of pulling the, the viewer, the, the soccer fan in to getting to know that personality a little bit better. So when the World Cup does come around, hopefully these uh, these figures will be will playing in, uh, on the world stage and it feels it makes you feel a little bit closer to that individual. You're probably going to watch that player a little bit more carefully than you would seeing 22 players and, and they all kind of blend together. So... Um, yeah, well, best of luck to, to Mario and David. Thank you so much for being on uh, World Soccer Talk. Appreciate it, and uh, best of luck with the film. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, cheers. All right, Kartik, so where can listeners find you on the internet or on Twitter if they want to catch up on your uh, interviews and articles and analysis and uh, viewpoints? It's KKFLA737 on Twitter. Okay. Yeah, and you can find me 
at World Soccer Talk on Twitter, as well as, of course, on worldsoccertalk.com. And uh, thank you for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, Audioboom, and worldsoccertalk.com. And if you like the show, share it with your friends on social media and give us a review. And Kartik, going into this weekend with the uh, Championship Playoff Final, as well as, of course, the UEFA Champions League Final, and much, much more, what should they do? You should enjoy your football, but a uh, uh, preface to Manchester United fans, you're not going to enjoy it. Liverpool wins another Champions League.